All right, so death is unavoidable, okay? Death is unavoidable. Now, it may be a long way in the distance for you, or it may just be right around the corner. And the reality is we don't know. I mean, we don't know. I mean, you may be in poor health, or you may be in really, really good health, right? You, you may be in physically excellent condition, but, but even still, we don't know if for us, death is something in the, in the far off distance, or if it's something that's just around the corner. But what we do know is that eventually, we're going to die. Now, I know that there are some biblical examples, like Enoch, where you had some people who didn't die, but those were exceptions. So unless Jesus comes first, we as God's people, all of us are going to experience death. So the question, what happens when we die? Now, none of us can answer this question from personal experience, right? We don't have anybody here who died and has come back, right? If, if you claim that that's the case, um, I, I'm going to be highly suspicious of that, right? Um, none of us can speak from personal experience, right? It's not like we've, you know, we're, we're asking about a place you may have visited or some life experience you may have had. We're talking about death and the fact that we can't speak from personal experience of, oh, I can tell you all about it. I, I, it happened to me once, you know, and I came back. Right? It's not like that, right? So we can't speak from personal experience about what happens after death. But we have made some observations. So you've lost loved ones, right? We've all lost loved ones or, or perhaps you've lost a friend. And so there's thir- certain things you've observed, right? The, and, and there's certain things you know about death. Um, I've told Rachel my personal desire for when I die. Have any of you shared maybe with a spouse or a family member how, how you want your remains to be handled after, after you pass? So I've told my wife, um, I don't want to be cremated. Um, and, and I don't want to be, I, I really don't like the idea of being six feet under. Like, I don't, I don't like the idea of being in a hole. I like the drawer concept. You know what I'm talking about? You know, put me in a drawer. Now, I'm not talking about like a drawer in the bedroom. That would be weird. <laughs> that would require cremation, right? Um. I don't want to be cremated. I don't want to be in the deep hole. Um, I I like the idea of a drawer better. Um, The idea of a casket seems so confining. I don't like that, but I mean, I know you got to do that. Actually, if I just had my way, and I know I can't have my way, just take me out, take me way out in the ocean and just kind of just toss me out. Um, But you can't do that, right? It's not legal. It's not proper disposal. You you can't do that kind of stuff. Anyways. If you guys are thinking, man, this guy's weird, my wife would probably confirm that that is, in fact, the case. Um, But but here's here's what, um, here's the problem with my wishes. I'm acting like I'm going to be there. And, And perhaps, perhaps the reason why I've given the, the amount of thought I've given to this is because of the number of funerals and memorial services and celebrations of life that I have, that I've done. And I've been there at graveside and I've seen that big hole. And so I've, I've thought about this, but, but here's the problem with the thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like I'm going to be there. And that's a problem because think about this. Like, I mean, we, we can't help but think like in the present. Like, I mean, I, I don't know what it is to exist outside of my physical body, right? We, we've only known bodily existence, right? We, we go and we look in the mirror and we see a body. If, if you have the ability of sight, you can right now look down and you can see your, your hands. You can, you can see your feet. You can see yourself, your physical self. And so perhaps the issue is that I'm thinking in the present 
and I'm thinking about this body being laid to rest, and, and I'm like, ooh, I don't like the idea of being in such a space. But the truth is, it's not the case that when I die that I am going to be in such places. If you've been to a funeral, you've seen the deceased in an open casket perhaps, right? Maybe you've been to such a funeral. And you can see their body, but the person you know is not there. So what happened to them? I was having a conversation with someone recently who claims to be an atheist. She's a really nice person. And uh, it's, it's a place that I go regularly to, to get some food. And I was having a conversation with this person. And she shared with me that, that she was an atheist. And we had some good conversation. And I was able to um, share some of the reasons for, um, for why I believe that God exists. Now, obviously I believe that God exists because the Bible says God exists. In fact, the opening verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But outside the Bible, we can also do some apologetics, right? Which is, which is a term that refers to giving rational justification for the truth of, of our faith. And so we can, we can point to evidence outside of the Bible. We can use rational arguments to substantiate our belief in the existence of God. Now, if I was to ask her, and I haven't asked her this question, but if I was to ask her what happens to a person when they die, she would give an answer very different from the answer that I would give. I suspect her answer would essentially be that it's over. After death, there is no more. After death, you're done. You've left an impact. You've had an influence. But you are no more. But is this true? When we die, are we no more? Have we ceased to exist? We need to ask the question, well, what, what exactly are we? What, what exactly are we? Are, am I just a physical body? Are you just a physical body? Fingers and toes, hands and feet, arms and legs, a head, and then all the stuff inside, a brain, a heart, liver, kidneys, blood, right? Are, are we just the collection of all of these body parts? Is that who we are? Or... Is there more? Is there a part of me that, that, that cannot be seen? Is there a part of you that, that cannot be seen? Is there a part of us that when we look in the mirror, we can't see it? Is there a part of us that when we go to the doctor for an examination that the doctor can't see it? He can cut you open. He can see what's inside. But there's a part of you that he just can't see. The Bible tells us that we're more than our bodies. The Bible refers to soul and spirit. Now, I don't want to go into the area of, of asking the question at this time whether we are soul and spirit, as if soul and spirit are two different things, or whether we are soul or spirit, as if soul and spirit are one and the same. I just want to be clear that the Bible is, is presenting to us a, a picture of, of, of humanity 
that we're more than just the collection of our body parts, that we also have an immaterial self, a soul and a spirit. The Bible tells us what happens when we die. So so when we ask the question, what happens when we die, we rightly go to the Bible because the Bible tells us what happens when we die. So I can't tell you from personal experience what's going to happen. And someone else living today can't tell you from personal experience what's going to happen. But we can go to God's Word and we can look and find the answer in God's Word. So let's look at some instances where we get some idea of what happens at death. So the first is Genesis 35, and I'm going to start reading with verse 16. Genesis 35, beginning with verse 16, here's here's what it says. They journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So you just heard, Rachel's death is described. The writer makes reference to her soul and speaks of it departing. So her soul is departing from her body. She is dying. Then the writer tells us that she died and she was buried. So it appears that Rachel's body was in one place and her soul had gone somewhere else. Now if we move to the New Testament, Acts chapter 7, we read about a believer by the name of Stephen. And Stephen had incredible boldness, and we read about it as as he's addressing the leadership. And what Stephen earned for his boldness for Jesus was he got stoned. He was executed for his faith. And it says in Acts 7, beginning with verse 59, as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And then Acts chapter 8 verse 2 says, Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. So, So stones are hurled at Stephen. Now how many stones he was hit with, I don't know. But I suspect if you're going to die by stoning, that this is going to be a bloody and gruesome death. So they're throwing stones at him, and as he is being stoned, he prayed. And he said to Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he died, and then he was buried. So Stephen's body was in one place and his spirit had gone to be with Jesus. Now, this makes sense given what the Apostle Paul communicates elsewhere. Now, we read this. This is how we started this morning, if you recall Philippians chapter 1. And in Philippians 1, Paul is communicating his own perspective on death. Now, you may have heard those words, and and you might have heard that that statement, to die is gain, and, and that might have struck you because that is quite a perspective on death. To be able to look at death and say, that's gain. Well, Well, Paul has his perspective on death that he shares with the believers in Philippi, And I want to read it again, beginning with verse 21. Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. 
I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So notice, Paul is speaking of living and of dying. Living consists of fruitful labor for Christ. Living consists of remaining in the flesh, that is, the body. Paul sees death as gain. He personally desires to depart and be with Christ, which Paul says is far better. Now, I want you to notice the contrast. Paul desires to depart and be with Christ, but he understands that to remain in the flesh is beneficial to his audience. So Paul's departure to be with Christ means that he will no longer remain in the flesh, that is, in the body. So here we see death involves a separation. To be alive is to remain in the flesh. To die is to depart from the flesh. Now, for a moment, let's consider one of the events that happened at the cross of Jesus. Luke chapter 23, it describes criminals being hanged on either side of Jesus. And Jesus says to one of those criminals, the one who said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now we know that after Jesus died, his body was placed in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. But Jesus tells the criminal that he would be with him today. The body of Jesus remained in the tomb until early in the morning on Sunday. The criminal's body was removed from the cross and presumably buried. But Jesus speaks of the criminal being with him today. Clearly, Jesus is referring to them being together outside of their physical bodies. And so here's the answer to the question, what happens when we die? And, and specifically, the answer from a believer's perspective or the answer for a believer, what happens is believers in Jesus are present with the Lord at death. Now, this should be encouraging for all of us who know Christ as Lord. That as we anticipate our own future death, whether it's way down the road or it's just around the corner, that at death, we go to be with the Lord. So I want you to consider what Paul wrote, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. Paul says this, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So here's what Paul's telling us. If we're at home in the body, that is, we're alive in our physical bodies, then we're away from the Lord. Now, let me stop for a moment. One of the doctrines about God we see in the scripture is that God is omnipresent. I mean, God is everywhere. God is in this place. Now, I can't see him and you can't see him, but God is here. Psalm 139 teaches us that there's no escaping the presence of God. So, so God is omnipresent. God is everywhere present. But the Bible also teaches us that God is specially present in heaven. So last week we talked about heaven. We, we discovered that, that God's holy habitation or God's dwelling place is heaven. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray to our Father in heaven. And so here what Paul is saying is that as long as we're in these physical bodies which is true of all of us here today, we're all in our physical bodies, we are away from the Lord. 
But then he says, if we're away from the body. So, so what that means is that our soul or our spirit has left our physical body. Then we are at home with the Lord. Now, some of you may be happy to be absent from the body. Don't raise your hand and tell us. But, but you may be happy or you may be encouraged with the prospect of being away from your physical body because your physical body doesn't feel today the way it once felt. Right? Perhaps your, your, your body isn't functioning at its optimal level, right? You woke up this morning and you had pains. Right? You woke up this morning and, and you weren't feeling so well. Maybe you're experiencing weakness. Maybe you are in constant pain. I mean, eventually, these bodies wear out, don't they? The longer we live, the older we get, right? You, you, you don't have the same vigor that you once had. You don't have the same abilities that you, you once had. And, 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 and your body begins to... to Shut down. One day we will depart our physical bodies and go to be with the Lord, but we also have the hope of a resurrection body in the future. Now, if we continue in this text, we're going to see this. Believers in Jesus will face judgment. All right, so, so at death we go to be with the Lord, but believers in Jesus will face judgment. So just continuing here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, at verse 9, it says, so whether we are at home or away, at home in the body or away from the body, we make it our aim to please him. Now listen to this. And this is written to believers. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will answer for what we have done during our lives. Now, let's be clear. This is not a judgment to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. All believers in Jesus, all who are saved will go to heaven. Paul declares in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you and I have truly repented of our sin and truly believed in Jesus, then we are truly saved and nothing can change this. So our appearance at the judgment seat of Christ is about reward and loss of reward. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So Paul is talking about the day of judgment when the quality of our work will be tested by fire. And so we're either going to receive a reward or we're going to suffer loss. But notice clearly it's not the loss of salvation. Now Paul himself had confidence in the face of his own eventual death and the Lord's judgment. In fact, Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is come. And you might be familiar with this part. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. 
I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And then several verses later, Paul writes, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. So like Paul, we too can have confidence as we consider our own death. Now, quickly, it's not just believers who are going to face judgment, but those who do not believe in Jesus will face judgment as well. And so we go to Revelation chapter 20, and it tells us about the great white throne. And it tells us about the truth that anyone's name that was not found written in the book of life, that that person was thrown into the, into the lake of fire. And so we see that it's not just believers who are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, but it is unbelievers who are going to stand before the, the judgment of God, and specifically, we see the great white throne in Revelation 20. And again, to reiterate what we've said before, heaven is the eternal destination of believers, while hell is the eternal destination of unbelievers. In Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, he writes about the return of Jesus. And he writes this, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. So what happens when we die is for believers, we go to be with the Lord. And ultimately, all of us, believers and unbelievers alike, will face God's judgment. And all of us will either be in a place called heaven forever and ever and ever or a place called hell forever and ever and ever. Now, I suspect you've had some bad days before. I had a day this past week that, that, that just wasn't a great day. But you know what? That day ended and a new day started. Right? It's, it's good when you're having a bad day that thankfully you're not just stuck in that day forever. Right? Or, or maybe you're going through a, a bad season of life, right? You just kind of hit a rough patch at work, or maybe there's things going on in the home that are really challenging. Well, hopefully, eventually, those things pass, right? You, hopefully, you've worked through some of those things. I think it's hard for us to grasp the idea of forever, because for us, there's like an end point for everything, right? Eventually, something comes to an end. But when we stop and we think about eternity and we think about something that goes on and on and on and on, I think of that, that song we sing as a church that says, when, when we've been there, it's talking about heaven, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. Now, there's a theological truth there that, that is being communicated through that song. And that is, when we've been in heaven, when we've been with God for 10,000 years, that's a really long time, isn't it? The, the song is teaching us this theology that, that even when we've been there 10,000 years, we don't have any less days to continue singing God's praise than when we first started. But we could also apply that to the other place. We could take that same truth and we could apply it to hell and we can say that when those have been there 10,000 years, It's not over. In fact, they don't have any less days than they had when they first began. It's forever, and it's forever. It goes on, it goes on, there is no end. It's not just a bad day that never ends. It's hell, literal hell, 
that never ends. Right? Now, there may be a part of us that, that really would like to embrace a theology that says, well, you know, those who don't know Jesus, when they die, they'll just stop existing. Or, or maybe, maybe they'll suffer for a little while and then God will just obliterate them and they'll snuff them out of existence. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Or maybe there's a part of us that wants to say, well, you know, maybe God will just give them another shot. After they die, they'll, they'll get another chance. But again, that's not what the Bible teaches. It is the point that a man wants to die, and after that comes judgment. So when we're talking about heaven and hell, we're talking about forever and ever and ever. And the hope we have as believers is the hope of heaven. And the reason we have the hope of heaven is not because we're good church members. The reason we have the hope of heaven is not because we show up here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. The reason we have the hope of heaven is not because we're better than those other people we compare ourselves to. The reason we have the hope of heaven is because of Jesus. The reason we have the hope of heaven is because Jesus Christ died for our sins. Jesus died and, and he bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross. He took the punishment that we deserve because of our sin. He was buried. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead. We have the hope of heaven because the God of heaven has brought us to his son, Jesus, had, has convinced us of the truth of the gospel, and has enabled us to repent of our sin and to put our trust in his son, Jesus. I am saved and you're saved not because of our effort, not because of our works, not because we deserved it. We are saved only by the grace of God. So let's not avoid the death conversation. Church, let's not pretend like Death is an illusion. Let's not say, oh, could we talk about something more edifying? Or could we, could we talk, talk about something more encouraging? Let's talk about reality. Let's consider the inevitability of it. But let's also do so with hopefulness. Let's have the perspective of the Apostle Paul who could say, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To be able to say that to depart and, and be with Christ through death, that, that it is far better. Now, that doesn't mean that we're speeding death. That doesn't mean that we're like, hey, could, God, can we go ahead and die now? It doesn't mean that. But we have a perspective on death that sees death not as the ultimate end but as death, as that which Jesus has conquered. In fact, God has given us victory over death through his son, Jesus. So let me wrap it up with this. As we think about death and we think about future judgment, how, how ought we to be living right now? When you think about the fact that eventually death is going to come, maybe far down the road, maybe right around the corner, we don't know. As you think about future judgment, how ought we to live right now? Right, as a dad, as a husband. Right, we got dads, we got husbands in the room. As a single man, as a mom, as a wife, as a single woman. How should you be living your life? As a teenager at New Smyrna Beach High School. As a student in homeschool. 
How ought we to be living as God's people right now? And it's real simple. We live our lives for Jesus. We live for Jesus. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about resurrection. Now, in particular, he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the chapter begins in 1 Corinthians 15 with, with evidence, right? So, I mean, this, this is good material for somebody engaging in apologetics to go to, that in 1 Corinthians 15, you've got evidence of all of these people who saw Jesus after Jesus had been raised from the dead. And Paul even says that Jesus appeared to a group of 500 believers, most of whom are still alive. Which is pretty incredible that at the time that Paul composed this letter to the believers in Corinth, that most of those believers were still alive, who had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Now the reason Paul is giving this evidence, it appears, is because there are some who have questioned the idea of resurrection, resurrection in general. And so Paul is responding and he's giving evidence for the resurrection of Jesus in particular, but he's also arguing for the resurrection of believers in general. And so Paul is giving all of this incredible theological truth and then at the end of it, He declares that we have victory. In fact, he says, but, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But then the very last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, that's not just the men, it's, it's all the believers, brothers and sisters. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Church, in light of not just our future death and future judgment, but in light of our future resurrection, that is, these bodies that are going to die will one day be raised, in light of this incredible hope that we have, we're to be steadfast. We're, we're, we're to keep on being faithful to Jesus. We're to be immovable. We're to always be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. When you live your life for Jesus, it is not a waste of your life. In fact, it's the best way to live your life. Whether you're an adult or or you're a teenager, or you're a child, living your life for Jesus is the absolute best way to live your life. And as a church family, the efforts that we put into pursuing our mission, the efforts that we put into reaching people for Jesus is not a waste of our time. So in light of our future death, in light of future judgment, in light of our future resurrection from the dead, in light of the fact that one day we will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever, church family, we ought to stay focused on our mission of making and maturing followers of Jesus. We ought to give of ourselves to reach more people with the good news of Jesus. We ought to continue to gather Sunday after Sunday, after Sunday as a church family, that we might mutually be encouraged. That, that we might think about how we can motivate one another to love and good works. That we might pray together and sing together and, and hear God's word together. We ought to continue to gather and group and give and go. It's not a waste. So while there's the inevitability of death, Jesus has conquered death. We have hope beyond death. So church, let's live as those who have hope. Let's be faithful. Let's let our light shine. 
right, before others that they might see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Let me close with these words. These words of hope that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ.